Hello, it's the 8th of May, April, 8th of May, 2015. This is your host, Paul Carr, and this is episode six of the Unseen Podcast. This is the unscripted, unedited podcast that you've no doubt heard about. And uh, we're going to jump right into it tonight. Um, if you want to know more about the podcast, go to dot com okay tonight we have with us buckfield say hello buck hello paul thanks for having me and yes and for the first time uh mike bowler hello everyone mike bowler well, I'm the uh, owner creator of the A Skeptic's Guide to Conspiracy Co- podcast, and I'm a contributor to the Irreverent Skeptics podcast. And as a day job, I'm a uh, senior electrical designer working for evil corporations. <laughs> okay, and uh, we also have Patrick Festa. Hello, um, I'm essentially a science enthusiast, just a basic regular citizen who is uh, appreciative of what NASA does and, and tries to uh, sort of educate people into the reality of the, the real world. And uh, I even do a little bit of astronomy on my own. I just recently projected the sun through my telescope. I might even have a picture or two to share with you. Great. Okay, that's our panel tonight, Buck, Mike, and Patrick. And the topic we're going to discuss tonight is one that I'm quite interested in, I must say. Uh, And Buck has been focusing on quite a bit lately. So, Buck, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? Buck? Go ahead and kick us off, Buck, uh, on this topic of uh, faster than light and breakthrough physics. I think Buck may have lost our audio. Buck, can you hear me? Uh oh. <clears throat> well, we've, we've temporarily lost Buck. He'll be back shortly. Um, let me just tell you. Oh, there he is. Uh, Buck, I can hear you. Okay, let me, well, we're waiting for Buck to get his audio back. Um, Let me just tell you a couple things. We are an open participation podcast, which means that anyone who wants to participate can. Um, Well, all you need to do is send me an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com, and I will sign you up. And right now, now, people joining the panel pool will probably get an invitation for their first episode around July or maybe early August, and possibly earlier. It depends on how things go with other panels. Um, and right now, uh, it looks like we may not have an unseen podcast recording session on 29th of May. I will be unable to do it that night, and uh, we're still looking for so uh, if, if you're interested in being a host, let us know. Um, again, same email, unseenpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to support this show, we don't really have a financial support channel at this point. Uh, you can support the Wow Signal podcast, which is the parent podcast, uh, by going to patreon.com slash wowsignal. The Wow Signal will be back, back soon with some really interesting new topics, and uh, the uh, if you want to find out about that, go to wowsignalpodcast.com. And we are still getting, uh, working on audio from Patagonia. Uh, stand by. So, um, 
Mike, tell us a little bit about uh, the Reverend Skeptics while we're waiting. Uh, sure. Uh, it's actually we're, we're a group of guys that uh, it, 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 we, we kind of get together every so often. We'll put we'll uh, put together a show. We'll take on a topic. Uh, we've talked about all sorts of different atheist, uh, athe atheist topics, science topics. I think we even did an exploration into uh, uh, Orwell's uh, 1984 book at 1984 so we, we we take on whatever topic we feel like doing and uh just have fun with it yeah um and i i must say um uh, i'm a member of your uh, google plus community which is one of the more active engaged communities yeah it's nice that's how we met um, that's how we got to kind of got together and uh yeah, and, uh, yeah. So okay, so how how do we so how how can people listen to your podcast? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, you can find it at uh, irreverent skeptics all one word dot com. That'll get you to our website. We, you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, and uh, great, I'm trying to think what else we're. Can I can I ask what the uh, Google Plus community is called? Uh. I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, it's Reverend Skeptics. Reverend Skeptics. Okay, I'll look it up. Reverend Skeptics. Yeah, it's a good community. There's a lot of posts. Buck, you back? I am back. How am I coming through? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, we lost you. It's fine. Yeah, I okay. was a little bit concerned about that. It was something to do with the uh, Google settings. Oh well, look, you know, we're talking to some guy from Patagonia, and we're not paying any money for it, so. <laughs> I'm not going to complain. I think it, this is this is great. All right. Um, I'm so sorry. I missed the intro to irreverentskeptics.com. It sounds like my kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, check it out. Um, I'm. I think it's a. You know, it, to me, it, it's one of the more. Uh, it, what I like about it is that they're not. Not some of the more uptight skeptics. <laughs> yeah. Um, we try to have fun. That and that's the big. That's yeah. the big thing. Uh, granted, we got uh, our our jokes are pretty stale and dry or whatever, and but we you know we got a good group with, with who does this. Um, Erno, uh, Erno's great. He's from Finland. Uh, he, we kind of get a European uh, aspect of uh, some of the stuff, and you know, we just yeah, like I said, we just have a lot of fun with the the show. Right, right. You know that that that's what we're trying to do here. Is uh, I mean, I do a I do a very tightly edited fairly serious show and what I wanted to do is have a more relaxed conversation with you know just the community of people that are interested in these kinds of topics so um, and get pe help people get their questions answered and get my questions answered um, and yeah, uh, I, yeah. still my head around, my head around some of the things that uh, Ben Tippett said in episode one <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, Buck. Yes, sir. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, hand the ball off to you. Uh, we were talking. You you've been doing a lot of research on breakthrough physics and faster than light travel. So uh, let's start well, with that. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to ask Mike a question. Go ahead. Now, since he's with irreverent skeptics, uh, Mike, do you know why? Churches don't offer free Wi-Fi. I have, oh, I have no idea. Sorry. It's because they don't want to compete with an invisible power that actually works. Nice. Very good. <laughs> okay, you can steal that. I will. I will definitely steal it. Okay. Um, actually, uh, the. Uh, being a big fan of skepticism, I'm sorry, I'm uh, I'm fighting a bit of a flu. The uh, the the fact that I'm a skeptic sounds a bit at odds with the investigation of uh, faster than light, but I approach the physics problems related to that. To me, um, faster than light 
is a, a vision that very easily orients people toward what an end goal might be in the same way that um, transmuting lead to gold was the uh, vision of alchemy that eventually gave rise to chemistry. Mo our modern science of chemistry derived from this practice or this uh, goal that we consider now very disreputable of alchemy. And in project management, which is my field, <coughs> we, uh, we often need to organize in information systems, especially complex information systems, we need to organize a lot of diverse efforts, but because things are so complex, we can't micromanage every unit, every little team or every individual researcher. And you need a compelling vision by which people can <coughs> point toward the same goal. Alchemy provided that. <coughs> In, uh, in the case of revolutionary physics, or what uh, National Science Foundation calls uh, transformative research in the physics sciences, uh, this can be done by the science fiction visions of faster than light transit, which will become a huge priority when Earth, what Sarah Seeger calls Earth 2.0, is actually identified, and we're closing in on that. We're closing in on Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones that show signs of life. And we're going to want to go there. And we're not going to want to wait 10,000 years to do it. <coughs> this will make solving fundamental physics problems a uh, priority. And I have to say, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think much of the... Uh, of the current, a, a lot of the current discussion regarding faster than light and um, and physics related to it, because I think we have to fix our physics first before we can make any plausible speculations. And there is a lot of information available in the philosophy of science and the history of scientific revolution that gives us good clues in what directions we should be looking and focusing our efforts. And that's not being done. That's my concern, is that information from this area, which is exactly the kind of thing if in information systems project management, you were auditing the current operation of an information system development project. If you conducted that audit and looked at the operation, you would say, well, here's critical expertise that's not being incorporated into planning. And it should be. And that's my area of greatest concern, because we can continue on for another hundred years and not resolve the problems that Einstein came up with in 1905 and died trying to resolve. And they're still not resolved. Right. Well, now, physicists that I talk to say physics is not complete. It doesn't know everything. It hasn't solved all the problems, but it's not broken. It's, in other words, they're, they're pretty happy with the paradigm they have. What will break the paradigm? Well, the, and this is, this is a thing where people, I, I've gotten this criticism where, where people would say, well, look, if physics is going to be revolutionized, you have to say Einstein was wrong. And you have to say in what way he's wrong. And I think that's the wrong, I, I think that's an incorrect it's a, a fallacy of the false dichotomy. Right. Um, the fact that the Earth is not physically flat doesn't doesn't mean that we should use that paradigm when we're every time we're looking at Google Maps. If we if we couldn't use that flat Earth paradigm, then any representation on this computer screen would be useless. But we use it with the understanding that it's a view. Now, the prop and, and we do this all the time in the, um, thank you. 
Um, can, can I can I ask a question? I'm I, sorry. I'm not sure if I'm cutting you off or not. I, sounds like it sounds like you're about to say sort of the same thing. Let me get this straight. In other words, um, you're not actually saying that it's 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 likely that faster than light speed travel can be achieved. You're saying it's like the alchemy thing where where we we show that it has shown that it was wrong or the wrong way of doing things but because we were trying to do that we found the right way is that what you're saying about okay well that's a- faster than light speed is that what you're trying to do because because to me it seems like they didn't know they were doing it the wrong way they did they just thought it was the right way and they proved themselves nobody wrong. knows they're doing it the wrong way and this applies to us as much as it applies to anyone in the past well i, I mean i mean isn't I mean, the fact that E does, in fact, equal MC squared, doesn't that negate the actual possibility of traveling faster than light because of the mass thing? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a physicist, but I do understand that the, the, when you approach the speed, uh, uh, your mass becomes more, and, and it gets to the point where you need an infinite amount of energy to accelerate you any f- faster. So, I mean, isn't that a reality? Isn't that a, a real... Uh, um, um, Okay, well, let, I'm going to gloss over. Science. I'm going to gloss over some things like physics cannot tell you what mass is. It can't tell you what force is, and it can't tell you what space time is. That what they do is they say these are fundamental quantities. That means that in the mathematical equations that they have, these are things that they do not. In their equations, they don't reduce them to anything else, and they won't say what they are. And there's a, there was actually a, a big contest. There was a, an essay contest about what is time. It was, uh, I think it was conducted by the Perimeter Institute a few years ago. And they said, uh, they said well, what is time? And I couldn't, I couldn't find anyone who gave what to me is the conservative, the skeptical, and the 100% knowable knowably correct answer what we know it is is we know it's a thing that we observe this is true for celestial motion if you look at all the big revolutions of the past and there and even the small revolutions but they're less well known so they're harder to communicate and this is why i pick like warp drive and faster than light it's easily communicated so i'm philosophically in in science of philosophy I would be called a pragmatist with regard to this particular issue. And the, the, the issue there is that with, uh, with let's, let's take the Copernican Revolution. The uh, philosophers of science, I think I'm, no, I don't have the particular book of interest here, but um, in philosophy of science, what, and especially with regard to scientific revolutions, the thing that they've identified as being most distinctive for important revolutions is replacement of a cognitive science uh, factor called the object concept. We, we have in our minds uh, two ways of categorizing things, or two sort of uh, structures and pathways in our brain for categorizing things. They're either objects, or their processes. And you can tell this difference if you ever try to, um, if you ever try to alphabetize something, you'll have to go through, or at least I and I think 99% of the population, when I wanna find out, well, I have this thing that's H and I have this thing that's K, and I it takes me a minute to figure out, well, which comes first? And then I'll, I'll run through and I'll even like sing my childhood song of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then I'll say, oh, okay, G is here, D is there. The, we have a circuit for things that are processes, and it's how we recite things Fuck. we've memorized. Yes, sir. I, I think we I'm lost getting Paul. I think we lost Paul. I think he's frozen. Um, I'm, I've got a still photo here. I'm starting to hear some audio now. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay, Buck. Well, sorry. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Kill my camera. There you go. Okay, now, can you hear everybody here? You're, you're still breaking up a bit. I'm hearing you and the music. Up. Yeah, I can't hear him. Yeah, we're losing him. Um, well, since um, I, I'd, I'd like to, to further my question while, while he's coming. Oh, yeah, please. In other words, what I'm trying to say is you're, you're, you seem to be going off sort of on a tangent. And, I mean, history is all well and good and everything. And But um, what I'm asking you is it seems like you're suggesting, for example, the fact that alchemy was a mistake in the end we found out that it was wrong and, and chemistry took over and now we know how things actually work they didn't know it at the time but it, it led into the actual chemistry but it seems to me that you're sort of trying to have a pretend alchemy of physics like like you know faster than light travel it seems to me that we already <coughs> think at least for the most part, I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm no physicist and, and well, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna I'm object a little to bit your better than a layman, but what, what I'm, what, I'm sorry? It is possible to transmute lead into gold. We can do that with nuclear reactions. Yeah, with fusion. I understand. What I'm, what right. I'm trying to say is, though, is that as, as of right now, we do know that uh, I'm going to use, again, I'm not a physicist. I don't have any doctors or anything like that, but I do understand mm-hmm. somewhat uh, um, why E does equal MC squared, and it has to do mm-hmm. with the equality of mass and, 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 and energy. And, and what is and mass? When you start, well, when you start to travel of certain speeds, your your mass increases, your time, your your distance becomes shorter. It comes to the point where, as far as I can tell, you know, as far as I thought that the current uh, um, physicists understood, mm-hmm. faster than light speed travel is not possible. Now, would it yeah. be going down the wrong road to, to try and insist that it does, or are you using that as a well, sort of as a sort of uh, uh, a stepping stool? Let me ask you a question: If you get to point A from from a a location A to a location B without crossing the intervening distance, does that count as travel? Okay, but now you're now you're talking about something different. You, you know, now you're talking about wormholes and stuff. I, I, I'm I was, I'm trying to get to the crux. Definitely of Definitely not. I, I don't think much of the wormhole hypothesis. All right. Well, yeah. I'm trying to get to the crux of of your first statement. Yeah. Can I throw out a comment? Please. Sure. Yeah. Because I'm what I'm get what, what I think I'm getting from this this conversation is that. We're dealing with the provisional science. We're we're, we're making these forward steps. As we make these discoveries, it, you know, when when they first started, uh, you know, and they oh, can use the alchemy because they were, you know, they were trying to figure out, you know, how to transmute. They're trying to do all this stuff, mm-hmm. and they make these discoveries. Oh, if I introduce uh, this this to this, it creates this. Oh, I'm, and they start making these discoveries, and science is just these very little steps, these very various steps of discovery getting to a point where we're going to, we eventually get to a point like where we're at now, where, you know, uh, you know, the speed of light is constant. It is where, you know, we can't go, we can't go faster. Uh, mass is still being uh, examined. Uh, they're, they're still trying to, was it uh, dark matter and all that kind of stuff? What, how that relates to mass or what gives a particle mass, all that kind of stuff, all the quantum stuff that I have no clue on what's going on, but, you know, it's there, there, but we're making these small steps forward. And I think what we're getting to is, yeah, you know, I think that's large. I think that, uh, that story is largely, uh, that's what's called kind of a, a par- Popperian view, uh, based on Karl Popper. And he presents that view of science in terms of it is a cumulative process and it's the most popular view within science. It's the story that scientists tell about what they do, and they believe it largely. I mean, this is a I'm I'm drawing an awfully big paintbrush here. Uh, scientists do tend to believe this. Yeah, I, I don't. Think there I is think a, a social reason for that. Yeah. I think a lot of scientists don't really, you know, back in the day thinking about the philosophical foundations. Oh no, they don't know that they're Popperians. They just like they've read 
this uh -huh. heroic tale of the triumph of science. And, uh, you know, and they, and they present things that are, you know, typically scientists in, um, uh, in, the, in the most recent uh, uh, Starship vlog, I, I uh, kind of attacked Neil deGrasse, DeGrasse Tyson for some of, his, uh, some of his hideously wrong statements about philosophy. But uh, in his, uh, his latest Cosmos, he did a, oh, and I do, you'll like this, uh, uh, Mike, I did a, uh, I did a uh, spoof of creationist cosmos that I took, that I uh, ripped off from Funny or Die. Uh, so anyway, check out the Starship vlog. I've, I've seen that one. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I've, I've actually seen that one. Was that you? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Oh, uh, well, you know, what, what, what the upshot is that interject with, it, was, with the development, go ahead. Well, let, me just, let me just talk about the advance of cosmology and in the pre-Copernican paradigm, the Earth was at the center of the universe. After Copernicus, the, uh, the Earth was not at the center. This isn't, and prior to that, there had been the steady building, uh, and the kind of changes that, that fell out of, uh, I mean, after Copernicus, Heaven and Earth were no longer separate. I'm sorry, the, but the this Earth is was getting to a point where it's it's a long history story. We we un, we know the history, but the question was about the the real possibilities or the lack of the real possibilities. You the, said like, science built in this cumu cumulative way. That's a historical statement, and I'm saying that's largely wrong. I actually didn't say that. You did, but the, either way, it doesn't well, you didn't say cumulative. You said it builds step by step. I've said that, and and, oh, I, I, and I yeah, and I, I kind of tend to agree it because you have to, have, I mean, you have to build upon you know you, you got to understand what you're you know, uh, I guess you know, I mean, cut, coming from you know like uh, dealing with electricity and doing doing my electrical design, I need some basic start starting points to build my system, and mm -hmm. I need to under you know I need to understand. Uh, you know, there. You know, when I get into some of these, some of the weirder, um, trying to distribute, elect, you know, doing electrical distribution, getting some weird stuff. I mean, I need to understand what what the heck I'm doing, and I gotta, I gotta, I might, sometimes I have to learn something new, so I go, oh, I understand that now. I can, I can do this. I think mm -hmm. science is what that's what science is trying to do. We're trying to understand what are we looking at. I mean, are are we looking at, are we, are we I mean, the, the, you know, the 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 wave versus particle. What are we really looking at? And the answer is we don't know. We you know we, we can't tell. You know the whole you know that whole thing. I'm I'm, I'm I want to say that uh, uh, without you know, I mean the, I, I should and I like to say that that's only part of the uh, equation. Second part is some imagination. We got to you know. Uh, you know, okay, we're at a point where we can't get past the speed of light. Well, how can we do that? I mean, is there ways that we can get past speed of light? Uh, can we do something with the particle mass? Can we change something here? Is there some physics out there that we can put into this to say, okay, now we can reduce the mass once we go past that that uh, you know, the, the the light barrier, you know, or things like that. That you know, so there's that. I think there's that aspect too that we got to be considering. And any scientist who isn't doing that is, you know, they're, 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 they're missing out. I mean, that's the only way I could describe it. They're not being skeptics or they're not being how, think or critical thinking. So that's how might they, how might they approach that? Well, well let, let me, let me just well, add to that because uh, that's, I, I think Mike is, is basically saying the same thing I'm trying to say. In mm -hmm. other words, I asked you a question about, well, basically I asked you, uh, it does it equals MC squared, or are you disagreeing with that? And Mike put it in a way that, in other words, we have to study these things, and, and you answered by giving us a history lesson, and I'm like, I'm not sure why that is connected. So I'm literally asking you, do you think that E may not equal MC squared? Is that what you're saying? I mean... Um, I'm saying that if... You can't define what E is in the real world, what it actually 
is in rigorous terms to where you have very good clarity or mass, then I don't think you're in a, I, I think you're fine to say that this equation predicts certain observations, but that's, uh, I, I would equate that to the per, the person in the uh, in the well, in geocentric model who could predict with absolute accuracy the um, the celestial motions easier than the Copernican model, and their model had greater evidential support in terms of there was no stellar parallax. So, and I'm I hate to go back to history, but history of successes and failures is the only standard we have to go by and we well, the are thing is, the thing is we are in a historical the thing period. is we That's have devices on this planet we're using one of them right now and mm -hmm. especially the gps units that we use mm -hmm. that absolutely empirically shows that e in fact does equal mc squared mm -hmm. so i, I mean i'm oh, not sure yeah. where you're coming from um yeah, I, let me, what is, let me, well, what do you uh, mean by I think the, 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 Excuse me. Um, what I wanted to say was that, yeah, fundamental concepts like mass can't be defined in terms of more fundamental concepts because there aren't any more, at least classically, not a more fundamental concept. You know, they have, they have a more sophisticated way of looking at it, but you're just looking at, you know, at, at Newtonian mechanics. Uh, yeah, mass is a fundamental concept. Time is a fundamental concept. Space is. And the way, now, the way it works is you develop a consistent framework where they all tie together. And that, and that allows you to calculate the mass of something or measure the mass or measure mm -hmm. the speed to incredibly high precision in very consistent, repeatable way. And that's, that's what we call science. And you would you would say that that's that right. model is currently consistent? Yeah, it is completely consistent. Okay, fact, so there's no consistency is what drives gravity. theoretical physics. Yeah. Okay, well my understanding no problem with gravity? That physics that physics is proceeding trying to find out well what is going on, for example, with the Higgs. There's a uh, the you know the the LHC was designed to determine whether the Higgs had a mass of this amount or this amount. And it turned out that the result was like right in the middle. And they said, well, what's going on with that? I was at, uh, I was at a lecture that Stephen Hawking gave where he said, uh, he said, well, we have to determine whether the cosmological constant, you know, where it lies between zero and one, because we're not sure. And then it turned out to be greater than one. And these are things that, are you know far beyond the 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 physics that you're claiming is totally consistent. So I I would well, no, yeah, well, I would say there are anomalies. About, what what in well, the, philosophy of science we would call anomalies that give rise to. Um, they're not logical they, anomalies. They're 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 empirical anomalies. And, and uh, yes, you know the fact is that that we could measure the magnetic moment of an electron in Europe. To 13 decimal places, and in Chicago, the 13 decimal places, and get the mm -hmm. same answer. Uh, okay. Now, that took a, that took generations of very hard work, but it, it's to, it took more generations well, here to work out celestial now, spheres, and we sure. don't believe in those anymore. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're trying to talk about the par the Copernican paradigm shift. Which is an interesting historical study. I, I would grant you. Uh, I mean, they they could they could explain all the observations they had up to that point, but they were collapsing under their own weight with with incredibly more complicated theories every mm -hmm. time there was a new observation. So mm -hmm. they, even though they could explain the movements as well as Kepler could, mm -hmm. they they knew that they were they were it was doomed because because the new framework was so much more. More elegant. Do you not so see much more any, powerful and explanatory? Do you not see any similarity between that and the John, John or Buck, general and special relativity? John or Buck, or sorry, whatever you'd like to be called. Um, no, you're making you're making um, one of those mistakes that 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 uh, 
uh, I'm sorry to say that some theists make. What's that? And that you're 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 throwing in. You know, some people say oh, you're talking about apples and oranges, but you're talking about apples, oranges, bananas, plums, and grapefruits here. Uh, you're just throwing in a bunch of subjects and saying, well, well, one of those could be wrong. It's not a grapefruit. It's a watermelon. And therefore, everything else can be wrong. No, no. I'm pretty sure I haven't mentioned many... grapefruits or watermelons at all. <laughs> if you could tell me exactly what I said, is, that's what you object to. What, what I can address to... that. But when you, when you ask me to defend stuff I never said, I don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying. Okay, John, in, other words, in other words, you're bringing up question. too many subjects. <laughs> what experiment can we do that would that would show that that special relativity fails. We already know there's general relativity, which makes a lot of exceptions to special relativity for for non-flat space times. Special relativity is only only true in flat space time. But um, where where would you, where would you find some a particle a massive particle moving on a, a space time geodesic? Space like geodesic, you're not going to find one. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Not you know, if you tell, tell me the experiment. Tell me the experiment that we could do. That would, For what? That would, What's the goal? That would, that would show that it's possible to move faster than the speed of light. Okay, I think that. I mean, and, show, and this is there is no. Is, I mean, we we, we well, at, see, at the LIT, a, we. I think that's a mistake. Just like these guys work, just like I think Sonny White's trying to engineer a work field interferometer at NASA is a mistake because we're not ready for that. In an information system like for a business, we would never try and develop software before we had a rigorous understanding of the concept that we were trying to represent in our data. So you have to get the, you have, have to get very good clarity and make sure that your metrics represent this thing that you're observing well before you you say what you can do with it and but i'm just saying you know, that kind of information system rigor should be applied to these physics models and they they've gone so far beyond it that now they have they have in various interpretations that are now many decades old of there's the copenhagen interpretation and there's the many worlds interpretation, and there's the string theory, and there's the multiverse that, in some deep within the quantum foam, these I am. Not, Captain these are America. not interpretations; they are ideas. All of which are, are, um, are some of which are are still in the hypothesis stage. Some of which are well, in the no. theory stage. But but the okay. point is is that is that you can't get around the fact that E actually does equal M C squared. And there's well, no, there's no, there's no guesswork. Not, there's no, there's no, the that's not, that's not, that's, no let me finish. That's not, that's not yeah. a, that's not an interpretation. That's a fact. And, and okay. it's been proven a hundred times over. Okay. The, it's been proven more than a hundred times over that the sun comes up every morning. What's the difference? Well, I mean, now, now you're, now you're back to Hume, right? Where, <laughs> where, uh, no, I'm just asking a deep, question but... that to me is qualitatively super close. It's so close it's, as to it's just, it's if, just if, a valid, it's just if you can give me a valid answer to that question. Okay, sure. The I sun does not actually come up every morning. The, we, the earth is rotating and we perceive the sun as rising in the east and setting in the west because of the earth's rotation. I mean, uh, we don't have to explain that to you. You're, you're throwing this at This is what I'm talking about. This is okay, what I'm that's you're, the answer. You're throwing I apples and bananas and oranges and grapefruits and cherries and everything at me here. Just, no, just I'm, stick to I'm the saying, actual subject. Okay, that... That answer is the same answer I would give, where you take the, the observation of the sun rising, you take that action and that observation that had been very clear and uncontroversial for centuries, and you say, it's an observational consequence of us, right? Is that a fair characterization of your response? Okay, but what does that have to do with the, the speed of light and, and going beyond it? I'm saying that those those equations, for example, e equals mc squared, and those transmutations are an observation that have a lot to do with the kind of creatures we are and the kind of observations we do. 
Okay. Uh, now, to, if they turn the word, out the word to be transmutation is aspect. a bit mystical, but but okay. Sorry. The the word transmutation is not something is not a word I usually use in in a, in a scientific discussion, but that's okay. Transmutation. You mean the transformations of? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know what. Do you mean the like the Lorentz transformations? No, well, I I, I tend to use uh, like transformation of uh, one um, one observation or one phenomena, like uh, let's say anything that you would you would specify toward E equals M C squared. And I'm not saying that's specifically wrong any more than I would say the sun comes up is wrong, but there were anomalies that were noted with the idea that the sun comes up, even though they had very precise measurements of the sun coming up and they had very good models for predicting it. And it had lots of verifying evidence, all the good Pockerian virtues of a scientific model, uh, but there were anomalies that arose. And I would say that after a hundred years of the best brains in the world and the most expensive equipment that's ever been assembled to investigate such things, and we still have not resolved the problem, I would say that that qualifies as anomalies. Okay, can, can, can you identify the problem, uh, one problem that we uh, haven't identified that leads us to... We haven't uh, been able to get through physics. Quantum, we haven't been able to get relativity and quantum mechanics to play well together. That's true. Uh, well, well, no, we haven't been able to get general relativity and quantum mechanics played well together. Special relativity mm -hmm. and quantum mechanics play beautifully together. Mm -hmm. That's that's called quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the main thing that and, I would plead for, if I had a chance to plead for something specific from a an information systems risk management perspective, the kind of thing that would keep us from barking up the wrong tree, theoretically, would be to say, look, instead of saying these things are fundamental, just to say these are fundamental observations. Or, you know, instead of saying space-time, I would say our observations of space-time. In the same way that it would have helped theorists in the pre-Copernican model, or the pre-Darwinian model, or the pre-whatever-comes-next model, if if they had just said our observation of celestial motion, our observation of species, or our observation, in our case, our obser observation of, and insert your favorite fundamental physics quantity here, if we just said our observation of X, it would give us a degree of freedom that would have been successful in the past. And the reason that I go back to the past is that, as far as I can tell, it's the only place where we can look for examples of successful um, theoretical advances. And that's what we do in project management is we look at, well, what's worked? What's worked in the past? Yeah, but it, that kind of right, what, what, What's the real anomaly? I mean, uh, I mean, we, we, yes, we know that, that we can't get the equation of general relativity to work with the equations of quantum field theory. Uh, uh, but there's no experiment. We're losing you again, Paul. Theories yeah. that both work in their own regime. There's a small area where they intersect, uh, which is um, that we can't even get to in our in our uh, accelerators uh, for a very long time. So you know. Where's the anomaly? Um, it, if you are if you are within this framework that space time is uh, fundamentally real, and um, and we don't need to say well, I, I would say at its most uh, common sense everyday man on the street, why is it that we see space and time so differently? Why can I move my hand left and right, but I can't tell what we're going to be talking about in a minute? I can remember what we talked about a minute ago. So why can't I remember the future the same way? 
You're talking about the, the direction of the era of time. Is well, that really I'm talking about why, a, why, if, if space-time is a continuum, why is it so... I mean, in physics, that's not an anomaly because the era of time doesn't show up in physics. The era of time doesn't yeah. show up on phys in physics. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I've taken a few physics courses, and we use time an awful lot. Yeah, and all the equations of physics, you can you can substitute still get a solution. Uh, it runs back the film runs backward in the common everyday world. Why is that? Well, some people think they know why. Uh, that's because the the initial condition is a much lower entropy state. Run backwards if entropy into the universe than it is at the beginning. Um, that, you know, Sean Carroll wrote a whole book about that. Um, it, and that it, that is a very interesting question. Why why is there a parent era of him? Uh, but uh, um, I think the music okay, might well, be degrading your signal. It's gone. Okay. Um, the. Uh, I'm sorry. What was the question? But anyway, the. Uh, well, I mean, we we understand that there's an arrow of time in the everyday world, right? Right. Uh, you can't unscramble an egg. Uh, um, a baby doesn't go back into the womb. And <laughs> the, Mm -hmm. There, there are. There's a, a clearly apparent arrow of time in the equations of physics. Mm -hmm. So, and that does seem to be an anomaly, but um, it has to do more with the physical mechanics of of the universe. The mm -hmm. universe apparently came into being in a very low entropy state. Why is that? Subject of current research. Mm -hmm. Not known why. Uh, but how does that get us faster than light? I mean, is faster than light even a meaningful concept? I mean, moving moving in a space uh, on a on a space like geodesic has, you know, that that's really no difference from moving. That that's equivalent well, to moving backward in time. And that, backward. that's my question: is is what is the how would we know whether this um, uh, geodesic is real or apparent? Oh, by measuring it, of course. Uh, well, I can measure. You, you, I can you, you, measure the motion of the sun. It doesn't make it real. Well, that that's what I would call real. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, the uh, you could consistently measure it. And so the I mean, sun moves because I can clips. measure it. That's a thousand years, years away. To me. Yes. <laughs> what? Well, it's positive that it's some kind of illusion, but how does that? Where does that get you? Well, it gets you to a place where you're able to uh, treat your your views as being from a particular perspective, which is, I think, is a smart move. I don't think we're capable to view the world from nowhere. We have a particular perspective. And I think that our theories, if they're going to follow the best risk management practices, they should acknowledge that. Um, in project management, one of the first things we are uh, we are instructed to do when we're planning an effort to create something new is to document our assumptions. You can never get them all, but uh, in this case, in fundamental physics, one of the things that seems to be assumed, which violates all kinds of good rules, for example, the, the Copernican principle, uh, the Copernican principle says, look, if your theory is a good scientific theory, it cannot assume that humans have any privileged observational status. Well, humans sense three space dimensions and a time dimension. Standard cosmology, standard model cosmology, assumes three spatial dimensions and a time dimension. Well, if it's going to violate the Copernican principle in this way, there should be some good justification for that. 
And if any anyone here or anyone listening has any um, any can provide anyone who has ever documented a justification for why this is a good assumption to make or it should be made, uh, I would be thrilled to learn of it. As far as I can tell, and I've looked for several years for such uh, material. Um, as far as I can tell, it's an undocumented assumption, and undocumented assumptions are a a horrendous sense of risk in pro in complex information systems. Can we go back over that again? What's an undocumented assumption? An undocumented assumption is something that no, is. No, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, wh what do you? What in physics is an undocumented assumption? That the time dimension and the three spatial dimensions are fundamental characteristics of reality, of the of the the lowest level of reality by which we would uh, that we would ascribe to the universe, which is also yeah. kind of a vaguely defined term. There are tons of people studying that. Uh, I mean, the whole. Well, idea I make no I make no claim about how many people are studying it. Or, or and and therefore, and, and certainly I wouldn't say it's undocumented. I mean, the, uh, some of the smartest minds in physics have attracted this problem. How, okay, uh, well, name name a person who has documented the assumption that that it is an assumption that the three spatial dimensions and the one time dimension are an assumption of the standard model, as opposed to asserting it as a, as pretty much like an article of faith. Like, why is it good to assume that? Sorry? What's the difference between that and an assumption? Well, no, I'm I'm saying saying it is an assumption. Herman Vile. Pardon? Herman Vile. Okay, he what does he into, say? He looked into, I mean, this was back in the, what, the 1930s. Uh, he looked into, and I, I'm going on memory here, mm -hmm. five-dimensional worlds and so forth, uh, and gauge transformations. He actually came up with a theory that did a pretty good job classically unifying electromagnetism with gravity, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, you know, that's not very interesting uh, because they were looking for a quantum theory uh, of electromagnetism at the time. And, okay, and, but documenting that these dimensions are an assumption of the model. Well, I mean, he said, "What? Well, what if we? What if we don't assume it's four dimensions? What if we look at five? So, no, no. I mean, adding lots extra of dimensions is so fine. That's that's equivalent to like saying in the heli in the uh, sorry the geocentric model. Well, we're going to add extra epicycles. We will we will add. Well, those if, if you're to asking make the orbits the question about what happens when you add dimensions, then you're not assuming it. <laughs> sorry. So, uh, I I would say that. It's extremely well documented that that uh, physicists have assumed a three-dimensional uh, world, spatial world, and there, it's also very well documented they have looked for other dimensions. Uh, they, they've looked. Okay. For, well, all I'm asking is for one citation of that, where they say we are assuming this. We don't know if it's true, but we're going to assume it. Because that's what we're supposed um, to do in good planning. In my field, we have to right. do this. I, 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 oh, I understand. That. I understand. That, but you know, if I was doing risk, as one of the few things I would list as a risk is what if the, what if we live in a four-dimensional space? You know, uh, it, it would it wouldn't it wouldn't come up, right? Because we have so much good observation. That's consistent with three dimensionals, three dimensions of space. If there are more dimensions, they are hiding from us, and and there's been a lot of theoretical work on that. Oh, I no, yeah, I agree 100% with. There's tons of evidence for there being three dimensions. I would I would say is that I would and I, then I would ask is there more or less evidence of that than there is of celestial motion. Or separately created species, or insert your favorite paradigm of science of the past here that has been but what, overthrown. Again, what does this have to do with the subject that, that I would say more, uh, we're talking about faster than light speed? Or, I'm okay. Um, I'll I'll get to what it has to do with FTL. Uh, what was it? What was it you just said, Paul? You broke up a bit. 
No, I think I was just asking Patrick to speak up a little bit. He sounds okay. kind of faint to me. Um, the, the thing that it has to do with FTL is the limit on FTL is based on rules for space time. So in again in the in the the information system world we call this a constraint, and that um, that puts limits on the concept space within which you can work. So if you want to know um, if you want to know how to plan your work, you need to be able to define that boundary clearly. If we have a clear definition of what space time is then we can establish that boundary of our theoretical investigation. Okay, but what I'm trying to get at here is, is that we've been at this for what an hour, uh, more than a half hour, almost 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. say a half hour because I think the first 15 minutes were... And, and so far, all I can tell, again, I don't, I don't have an English major, so, so, you know, and, and so, so far it sounds like a philosophical thing with you. <clears throat> um, so far, you've been basically talking about semantics, or, or at least language of how do we talk about faster than light speed. So far, you haven't mm -hmm. explained what you meant by the possibilities of faster than light speed, except to give us a history lesson. And 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 I, I don't mean to be. I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but it's so far I haven't heard anything that says well. You know, I have this idea that maybe it's possible because this or the other thing. And, and and you haven't done that. All you kept doing was is showing us, you know, talking about uh, what we've done in the past and how alchemy became chemistry and and and, and the Copernican versus the the uh, T Ptolemy uh, uh, universe and th th these things have nothing to do with the actual um, 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 attempt to to figure out if light speed or faster than light speed travel is possible, except to give us a history lesson on how science has progressed. It's uh, the, the thing that it has to do with is context and context matters. So if I take a knife and I stab someone with it, it matters whether I'm uh, saving their life by removing a, uh, uh, a deadly tumor or I'm trying to murder them. If okay, so we're doing it again. I'm sorry, but context. Now we're talking about analogies of of of, of uh, saving human life. Context. Stuff. Yeah, we're talking about context. I'm talking about action. actual physics. You okay. Know, the, the the subject is you. I thought you were going to talk to us about faster than light speed travel, and, and yeah. I can't I can't make the analogy between taking a knife out of somebody's body to save them and and that how does that have to do anything with Faster than light speed travel. I, can, can do you have any science explanation as to what you're talking about when you talk about the possibility of faster than light speed travel? As I see it, I don't think it's possible. But again, I don't have a PhD in in physics, so uh, well, tell me what counts tell. for you as a science explanation. Well, well, I mean, you keep giving these analogies about 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 you know how science progressed and and and. And uh, uh, analogies about just now you talked about uh, stabbing somebody in. Po I mean, what does that have to do with the science of trying to find a way to travel faster than light? I know that we all wish we were in a Star Trek series or a Dune series where we fold space and stuff like that. But do you mm -hmm. actually you have an idea <laughs> of, of 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 how that might be possible? Well, um. I don't think I have one that you would like. I think that because I think that our concept of space time has to change. It has to evolve. And that's um, and that's kind of pre-science. It's a pre-science change. S sort of like if someone wanted to say uh, that the Earth moved in the pre-Copernican days. Um, and I, I don't have, I, I wish I could give you an example that would be clear that wasn't from the past, but we don't even have any terminology for things that will come up in the future. Um, all I can do is say that, that the kind of research that has gone on for a long time, like the kind of research that we're currently having that's gone on for a long time and has produced greater and greater complexity 
the the resolutions of the past i believe should be um taken as lessons learned for our situation well actually i do like that in well, fact that was my first question for you in fact um um in other words in other words i was asking you if you meant that it was sort of a, 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 the analogy, going back to the analogy of, of how we were shown that alchemy was wrong and, and, and it turned into chemistry. You're saying that it's possible that we may be thinking of it wrong. It's possible that there is a there is something we're missing. I mean, I can understand well, that without I going would, into the analogies of stabbing somebody and pulling the knife out of them. You know what I'm saying? I, I, could, I could get that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there may be something we're missing and, and there may be some revolution in physics that we haven't found yet, but... You know, uh, that's what that's what I'm trying to say. In other words, well, I and I will go further than that. I will say not only could we do that, but I think that we should, and I think that science should always do that. It should always treat, and this is supposed to be a common virtue of science, that we treat our most cherished ideas as subject to refutation and replacement by a different idea. Um, we now have, like, it used to be, okay, I'm not going to go back to an historical well, analysis. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> as far as I know, that's what science is supposed to be doing all the time. Because that's what's worked so well in the past. That's why we love science. It works. I mean, that seems to be like the, a sta the standard explanation of skepticism. We, we have to be able to, to provisionally change our views when new information is presented to us and if we can find you know i mean i'm again i'm trying I've, I've been trying to follow this and you know it, it just seems like yeah I, I if i'm understanding what you're saying is that we have a we have a good idea what light is light speed we got a good idea mass energy but there's room to change or room for uh you know if we explore the speed of light more, maybe we could find something within it that we could change. And then that could end up, we can end up finding out we can travel faster than light, but we have to, I mean, we can't just be dogma dogmatic and say speed of light is this and mass <clears throat> is this and energy is this. And we can't go anywhere past that. That's not science. That's, that's blind faith theology. You know, uh, we have to be able to, uh, as the paradigm changes, we should be able to adjust our uh, what we well, what we what we understand, and, and that's what and that's science. It moves forward, and that's probably what I was trying to get at. Mm -hmm. yeah. I uh, I agree, and I would uh, I would say that uh, we we can say I you know from a certain point of view we can say, and it's proper to say, and it's the right thing to say. Uh, the sun came up here at this place at this time. That's that's a good thing to say. The uh, did you see that satellite moving overhead, or did you see the star going by, or planet going by? Um, but we know in the back of our mind when we use the flat Earth model, like on this map behind me, we use the flat Earth model when we look at it. In the back of our mind, we know well it's not really flat. But the the ability to use maps was a revolutionary advance. When people used to say, oh, to get from point A to B, you have to walk for two days. And then when you see the rock that looks like this, turn to the left. And, and uh, you know, the time that it takes you to say this prayer that many times, you'll reach a stream or something like that. They had these stories about how to get places. Once we got the idea of the flat earth, that was a, and we could draw pictures in the mud about where we wanted to go, that was a huge advance. Then we got the spherical earth. Then we got the heliocentric model. Then we got the kind of the modern, uh, you know, nowhere, nowhere, or well, we thought our galaxy was sort of it. And then we found out about uh, the rest of the thing where it turns out every, everywhere is the center. But, um, you know, I, to me, history, the, the, the grandeur of science in part is due to the fact that we find out how our assumptions about things which were so reasonable, we didn't question them. They turned out to be totally wrong. I mean, there is 
I mean, I, I mean, in my day job, I'm, I rely heavily on Ohm's law and Watt's law. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I, I, when I do my calculations to figure out a wire size, I follow that. And those laws, of, these are laws of physics. Like you know, the, this, this is what keeps your house from burning down. Okay. Right. If, if I if I if I disagree with Ohm's law, yeah, there's disaster. Oh, people will die. Yeah, and, people will die. Okay. And, yeah. yeah. So yeah, in engineering, every, everything is based on re repeatable physics, right? We, exactly. we we don't we don't do anything engineering that's that's cutting edge experimental. Right. Uh, if I the, did, I'd be out of a job. The you history know? is the best, most reliable guide to the future. Yeah. So what I mean, worked? What caused yeah. people to burn down? Yeah. I mean, okay, but okay, so we we need an anomaly to have a paradigm shift. And the problem is, as you develop more and more experimental evidence, there's fewer and fewer gaps for an anomaly to sneak in. So it doesn't mean there can't be one. It just means that, uh, you know, somebody's got to think of something really radically different. And I don't think anybody has up to this point. Well, there's a I, lot of people looking so at background no independent need, theories. There's right? no need to start up the, the LHC or there's no need to rigorously define mass or other fundamentals. To me, how do you decide something as a fundamental? But ma mass is rigorously defined. Okay. Very rigorously. We can okay. measure it to many decimal places. That doesn't mean... If you, if you can measure it to many decimal places, it's defined. Rigor of its, definition. <laughs> it's a coherent definition. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be defined in terms of more fundamental things because it's not fundamental if there's something more fundamental to talk and define in terms of, right? So, uh, if How we do you have know if it's fundamental, and, and the fundamental the fundamental def definition is mc squared uh, equals mc squared. It's all energy, right? I mean, what what gives most matter its its mass is the energy, the binding energy, and its nucleus. Okay, it's, why isn't that a special pleading? Why isn't that the fallacy of the special? Why isn't that what? Well, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a reliable. I'm perfectly happy to accept that it's fundamental, but what I but what I need in order to do that, and I think any rational skeptic should need, is a principled definition of when we are allowed to say this is fundamental, and we're allowed to say it's fundamental because. We've got this definition. Anytime you've got uh, like a an equation, let's say equals mc squared or something like that, for which we can find no exception, and we've looked a lot, and and certainly it's fair to say that we have, and we haven't found any violations of that um, equation. Uh, are we going to say that an equation like that that describes a relationship for which we found no uh, exceptions, can we then say that the thing in the real world that this variable in our equation applies to, we're allowed to say that that thing in the real world is fundamental and should not be investigated or is not to be investigated no. as an observation? No. 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 Okay. no not so what principle? No. You, what, principle what it means is we developed a very coherent framework where things like mass, space, time, energy, uh, other symmetries that that have been discovered uh, mm -hmm. all fit together in a in a in a framework that's coherent, consistent. I agree 100% with that. And and uh, not, no one thing is fundamental in isolation. It's all it's all a, a particular uh, space and space time. Ma even in classical physics, space, time, mass are not independent fundamentals. They all depend on each other. Newton wrote when Newton wrote down his laws. He did not write. He did not say, "Here's the definition of inertia." He said, "Inertia is that what happens when you push it and it goes this fast and this, and that that quickly, and that is you know." So we we tie the all everything together. Mm -hmm. It's it's coherent, not fun, it's not foundationalism. Yeah. Uh yeah, you're, that, you're, that if works. you're trying to separate. It absolutely works. Right. Uh, if you, yeah, uh, Buck, if you're trying to separate these things into fundamental things, that's not the way science actually works. We can predict eclipses thousands of years in advance. Right. Because we ha we know we 
understand these things that well. But you can do that with geocentrism. No, no, you can't actually. Why not? Because it wasn't that accurate. That's why. That's why it was found to be wrong. Because because uh, com- uh, com- was it Copernicus who came along and said, you know what? I think I know what's wrong with your model. I know why it's not exactly working the way you thought it would. And he came along and said, because I think the sun is at the center. This explains it better. And the calculations came out better. That's why the science advanced. Well, they didn't come out better right away. It, t- it took a f- few generations. But they did eventually come out much better. Well, okay. Uh, you know, you know, yeah. you, you know, because you, the, the observations yeah, I didn't want to give a history lesson, you know. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, the idea is that, uh, you know, I, I could not do my job if classical physics and some quantum physics and a, l- a little bit of relativity were not extremely reliable, repeatable, and all that fits into a coherent framework. I, I, look, I, 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 but I agree with, I, I agree that uh, reliability is for the things that you're using them for is the appropriate criteria for use, except where you have uh, challenges that resist resolution. Well, that's just it. That's why science is. What Show it me is. the challenge. In other words, in other words, um, there are going to be things that we still think that are missing. In other words, okay, we do understand how this works. We understand how that works, but I'm not quite sure about that thing. And and science always tries to investigate further. For example, uh, uh, to go back to the E equals MC square again. Yeah, I'm the not fact, asserting the fact that, that it doesn't. The fact that the 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 fact that the unfortunate creation of the hydrogen bomb uh, was was made is mm-hmm. is empirical proof that we understand that E does equal MC squared because we created a fusion bomb that was so scary that we never used it. And in fact, they used a fission bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which was just as scary in some cases. But but the point I'm trying to make here is is that this would not have, this horrible you know absolutely you know uh, evil weapon was created because we suddenly understood that e equals mc squared now i'm not trying to promote this bomb or anything like that but i'm trying to point out here is that mm-hmm. there are things that we do understand but yet in that to give you an example of what wasn't understood was mm-hmm. that when they created this bomb this the physicists at the time calculated I think it was something like 7 megatons or something like that, and the damn thing blew up as a 10 megaton. So they were off by 3 freaking megatons. <coughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, so they were wrong. It was more powerful than they expected it to be. So in other words, there are mistakes being made. There are things that we don't quite got, get right. But that doesn't mean that it didn't work. You know what I'm saying? And, and I hate to use this, such a horrible thing as, as, as an example, but that isn't... Yeah, true. but you're arguing against a point I'm not making, which I'm not saying any of this stuff doesn't work. I'm saying that it has that it has flaws that any reliable information system should not have, and uh, the, the increasing... Uh, the increasingly... I, and I'm going to say bizarre... Proposals uh, such as uh, you know, such as the multiverse and uh, uh, string theory, with increasing numbers of hypothesized dimensions to allow for uh, all kinds of uncertainty. The idea of uh, uncaused effects um, and so forth, things that start to violate the the assumptions of science, then suggest at least to someone in the information business, that there's a problem. It doesn't mean that you haven't had spectacular successes. I'd be the first to admit that our current model is as successful as anything in history, but all models have been that way. All models have been like the most successful up to their point. And I think that there will be, I think pe- you know, people in a, a thousand years from now will look back at us and look at us the way we do people of the past. I I, I feel like that's a very conservative position. I don't feel like actually, we're I, I agree. special. I, I understand. I understand, actually, because I, I know what you mean by these weird ideas about these uh, string theories and stuff. And it seems like, okay, we haven't even actually seen this yet. It's just another idea that's out there. But that's where science starts. It starts with ideas and hypotheses. And you have to test those ideas and hypotheses. Mm-hmm. You know, right. yeah. um, what that has to do with the 
other things, I'm not sure. You know, I, again, my I, you know, this conversation is starting to get beyond my IQ level. But I, in other words, I don't want you to. You know, we're sitting, in other words, what you like? I, I, I don't want to insult you. It's just that we seem to be sitting here talking about history, and I understand where you're coming from. Where, like you said, the, the things are we're starting to talk about uh, semantics. I, I mean, uh, we're, we're we, you know, that's true. What do we mean? We're, we're talking about the history and how science changed, and mm-hmm. it's getting to a point where we seem to be heading up to a brick wall. Maybe of, of we can't think of anything better yet. And but again. Why are you asserting that faster than light speed is possible while really you're arguing about the change in the scientific method, so to speak, or the way we think? I'm not sure how they're connected. I understand where you're coming from and how sometimes it seems like we're headed up to a brick wall. It seems like we almost know everything that our minds are capable of knowing until we evolve into a smarter being or something. I understand where you're coming from, but still... Still, I have a problem with the idea of trying to figure out how do we can go faster than the speed of light when we know that, in fact, E equals MC squared, and that, and that seems to negate that possibility, unless, of course, which they are investigating, or at least hopefully, there's something missing, something we haven't seen, something, something that E equals MC squared, unless, you know, something else. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? E equals MC squared in our universe, but if there's another, you know, way of looking at it, you know, that sort of thing. In other words, I, I could understand yeah. these thoughts, but but if you're just throwing history at us and, and semantics, it just doesn't equate. I think there are some interesting concepts that have been thrown out for faster than light. Uh, one, so, I mean, uh, some of the ones that have that are more popular now are probably not that promising. Uh, even Alcubierre himself will tell you that he doesn't think that his warp bubble idea is very likely to, to work uh, mm-hmm. because j- just the raw physics of it, it just requires technology that is almost inconceivable. Uh, and negative and, mass and negative energy. Well, yeah, you need negative it's energy density. Which, and, yeah, perpetual motion. Yeah, which is stuff, that, stuff that we just don't even – it basically requires unobtainium. Uh, exactly. And uh, – <laughs> <laughs> Which <laughs> you know, the first unobtainium <laughs> miners will make a lot of money, but uh, yeah, I kind of like the. Uh, oh. no, I'm just gonna say, that, uh, Richard Hoagland, he likes to put what? What did he's got that uh, something physics that he throws about, and he wants you. Oh, he, wants, yeah. he, he needs people to believe that uh, the speed of light can change. That somehow gravity or something. Oh, wait, a wait a minute, I can reach my revolver. Uh, <laughs> Hoagland. Who is this? Richard Hoagland. Richard. He's got, yeah, he he seems to believe that. Uh, well, he's one of the. He's the guy that pr- promotes the uh, the face on Mars. Um, really? He was the original. Yeah, he's, he's the last guy still promoting you. face on Mars. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? <laughs> my other show with the, the conspiracies. I've I've done stuff on Hoagland, and there's some other good podcasts out there that. Yeah, this guy is, uh, he's convinced that there, there were people living, they were, lived on Mars, hmm. uh, they, they lived on the moon, uh, and they, they use a special physics that allows them to do whatever, and they can uh, change. A special physics. Yeah. Uh, that, that's <laughs> only, uh, it's pretty special. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember, he has a name for it, and he, uh, uh, trans something physics. I'm sure he does. And uh, it, it's so funny because he, yeah, and it all depends on the ability to slow down or speed up the speed. Very a bit of a charlatan. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, we know we know about those snake oil salesmen. Yeah, uh, but the point I'm trying there, to make is, I'm sorry, Paul. That maybe uh, the notion of space time as as a continuum could be challenged. Uh, and you could build little bubbles of uh, have uh, have its own local speed of light, and you could zip around it. Bubble was one of the first theoretical. I I lost the last of that, Paul. I'm afraid.
Well, it seems like we lost Paul. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask, does anybody, has anybody heard of this? APR. Oh, there you are. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I was, I'm not, I'm not going to make this claim, but I'll state the argument that, uh, that, I've, that people like Jeffrey Landis have made is that faster than light travel must be very difficult. Otherwise, we would we would see, be seeing a lot more of it. And uh, um, if one solution to the Fermi paradox that faster than light travel is either impossible or very very hard. Um, and as and as uh, you know, Ben Tipper drive we could do whatever we wanted, go backwards in time and everything. Uh, so. There's a, there's a kind of empirical evidence, not very, in my view, not very complete, but that faster than light travel is at least extremely difficult. It requires a very highly advanced technology, or possibly it's impossible. Yeah, basically, it's basically what I'm saying. It's it's uh, uh, there, unless there's something we're missing and. Um, and- by far, we haven't yeah, can't, can't possibly know everything. There may be a lots of things we're missing. So until we find that missing thing, uh, so far as we can tell, our best model in physics seems to suggest very strongly that faster than light speed travel is so far impossible. Now, when that thing pops, you know, rears its beautiful head and says, "Wait a minute, you forgot about me." Um, maybe it is possible, then then we'll jump up and down on the trampoline and, and jump for joy. But until then, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical. Of that. It just, just seems to be impossible so far. I mean, yeah, same I, here. I mean, we all, we all love sci-fi. I, I don't know about you, but I love sci-fi. And I, I do. You know, I love yeah. Star Trek, and, and, and uh, Gene Roddenberry is a genius. But, but let's face it, it was Hollywood that said, well, let's, let's figure out a way to uh, get these guys around the, uh, the, the galaxy quickly. And uh, they, you know, the pen invented warp drive, you know, and everybody's trying to think, you know, all the, all the, all the laymen out there are trying to say, yeah, warp drive is possible, and they come up with these stupid things, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, the dilithium crystal is the classic unobtainium, right? Yeah, unobtainium. <laughs> I, I, I never, I'll never get over that name. They actually put that in the movie. <laughs> Which is because you can change it to dilithium. <laughs> uh, I, I, Paul, if I you, lost if you're, everything. I'll attribute yeah. to. Paul, if you're on Wi-Fi, get, get, a, get an Ethernet cable and plug straight it's, in. My own personal view is, just, is that there could be a breakthrough in physics that might show us a way that we could get information to, uh, faster than light. Uh, but right now, everything says no. Stop! Don't let it go there. Uh, and if we can get in, for, uh, then we can eventually get matter to, across that that same. Yeah, um, I'm I'm sorry, um, Paul. If if you're running off of Wi-Fi, get it's an hard, ether, hard get enough. An, get an Ethernet it's cable and plug it in. Enough to figure out how to make a rocket, or not a rocket, but. Any spacecraft. It's hard enough to figure out how to make any spacecraft go one one percent of the speed of light. I don't think he can hear you. Yeah, I don't think so either. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hear okay, I was, I was I was just saying, if you're running off of Wi-Fi, um, please get an Ethernet cable and plug straight in because we're, you're really breaking up bad. I uh, I can't do that right now. It's it's about two hundred feet away. Uh, uh, so that uh, I, so I did I did actually come up with the, with a hypothesis. My hypothesis was that I think Paul's uh, problem is probably running off a of Wi-Fi that's 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 not always stable. Well, no, I, I have I have five <laughs> I have five bars on my Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, I love it. <laughs> but I did figure but, it uh, out though. Uh, right? I figured out that you were on Wi-Fi, right? Yes. Well. Um, we just moved into this house, and I'm still working on uh, where I'm going to podcast from. That's not in, in uh, earshot of a television set. Ah, <laughs> uh, work but, uh, faster. Yes, <coughs> the Verizon guy. The Verizon guy put the uh, he put the uh, the hotspot in probably the worst possible room. So. <laughs> oh. 
Sorry to hear that. Anyway, um, let's kind of wrap this discussion up, and I'd like to sort of go around the table and let everybody have one last uh, say. And we'll start with uh, Mike and then go to Patrick, then to Buck, uh, and then I'll make a few remarks that off the air. So, um, uh, Mike, any any last words? Uh, do I have any last words? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's a really intriguing, it's an intriguing concept. I, I would love it that we could be able to travel faster than the speed of light, but you know what? Yeah. Until we figure out the ways around the physics that we are dealing with now. Yeah. I think we're pretty much uh, stuck, uh, probably not quite reaching that yet. So that, that's about all I have. Okay, is it my turn? Uh, Patrick. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I mean, again, I'm just going to say that uh, there are things that we're, there's always questions being asked. Every 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 answer that is made in science, there's always questions, you know, 10, 10 more questions to be asked. And uh, hopefully one of those questions will be rear its head and, and it'll give us a clue as to what we're looking for with the possibility. But as far as I can tell, there are just some places that we can't go yet. The only other thing I would like to say is science is interesting, damn it. So get out there. Let me just share this. Get out there and uh, do some backyard science. Um, I think I'm sharing that. There we go. Yeah, I see it. So, yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, that's me doing some backyard science. Uh, science is interesting, damn it. Get out yeah, there I, and do it. I bought my. I bought a telescope this, uh, over for uh, uh, Christmas, so uh, I got my... Uh, set up. I got to start working with that over the summer. I think Is that just a refractor running its eyepiece output onto a white sheet? Looking yes, at the sun. In fact, that's a 22 inch. And that's actually a small image. Um. If you like, I can I can continue this little conversation. Um, let me see if I can get to the actual picture, and I'll scroll through them. Um, the poster board is a standard 22 inch by 28 inch, and uh, so that image is probably about 14 inches in diameter. But the first time I did this, I, I actually had it further away, so it was actually more like 18 inches in diameter. And you got like good sunspots and all the oh, yeah. stuff. Um, <clears throat> that looks this awesome. Is, this is taken with a two megapixel tablet camera. So you can see the sunspots there through some wispy clouds. Um, I actually oh, have a, a man, hangout that's video. Great. Yeah, yeah um, and and if there was an eclipse coming up soon, it would be like nice to have it in the summertime with a barbecue and having an audience. normal eyepiece. For nothing. A twenty-five millimeter plus eyepiece. And I may be damaging it by doing this. Uh, a two megapixel camera, well, handheld. I wondered um, about that. There we go. I, okay. Did you check at all to see if that would damage your gear? Um, if like it did, he, I, would guess I already did it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's but, actually the safe, that's a safe way to do it because uh, you don't want to be looking into you don't want to use your eye into the eyepiece. Well, right. Uh, there you go. Mean, There's the clouds for you. There I know you damage your eye, but what about damaging the the telescope equipment to do? Yeah, this? well, it's possible uh, because I am using that diagonal and I am using a plus eyepiece because that's what came with it. Mm -hmm. um, but because I have a habit of not, there we go. Uh, I darkened this picture up, uh, because I have a habit of, um, um, coming up with some telescope equipment and suddenly running out of money and not being able to buy an, uh, uh, a solar filter. I had to resort to the projection. And since I also have the habit of not doing much nighttime astronomy, um, if I damage this stuff, then I'll have to hope for in the near future, there we go. Uh, I don't think you're, you're gonna, could be could be much more than ten watts or so on the eyepiece. Yeah, I, I, I mean, my, it, just my background, yeah. back of the envelope calculation. Yeah, I I never had any problems when I did that. Oh, great. So um, the uh, I have I have a, a previous video where the image is actually almost almost the entire width of the thing, like eighteen, nineteen inches in diameter, and some sunspots were actually clearer. But again, this is a picture of a projection with some clouding. Um, and actually, um, 
I actually uh, did this today. I I um I bought that is I I um, have a problem here with you can see it's a white table. Yeah. But in the past I had I had it on the ground with the green felt trying to darken up. As you can see here, there's a re bad reflection problem. Oh yeah. So the day after I did this, I actually bought a you know dollar store black tablecloth, and uh, some uh, I bought a compass. A uh, box of uh, three dollar box of uh, sidewalk chalk for the kids, that kind of, kind of thing. So today I marked off the uh, north, south, east, east and west, trying to get the telescope set up where I can use one control. And I was going to do some projecting today, but when I looked up, there was some um, serious clouds. You know, it still looks sunny out, but when I looked up, there was some serious clouds. So I decided. Hey, could to you do could you take that picture and put it at like uh, full resolution? Um. That's the best I can do right now, but I can tell you this. Going through Google, through mm -hmm. the Hangout, you're not going to see it as good. Um, I did share these. Um, okay. They are on my shared profiles. I think I shared them with the Hangout acquaintances, science enthusiasts. So I don't know. I didn't make them public. I wonder if I can – maybe I could share them with you. Actually, yeah, you can make them public. Sure. Let me see if I could who, – who actually asked me that? Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Just put them in the community. Put them in the community? Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. And uh, yeah. I plan on doing this again. I marked the sidewalk already, but I didn't actually make any projections. I'm hoping that tomorrow will be just as clear, perhaps even clearer, and I'll be able to put them up as well. That so, is really cool. So science is interesting, uh, damn let, it. Let's, let's try. <laughs> any last words? Besides, oh, my God, that's a Grizzly bear. Uh. Something is a grizzly bear. I I don't know. I don't think he was talking to me. I think I I think I controlled your mic for a while. Well, I was asking for any last words. <laughs> Buck from Buck. Oh, okay. Um. What do I want to say? Uh, I don't final, uh, final thoughts. Okay. Um, regarding standard model fundamentals of physics, uh, the universe, it, it, it seems like a best practice to assume the universe is very unlikely to function fundamentally in accord with human sense organs. Uh, we should... Uh, we should acknowledge that the assumption of an observer-centric universe is completely natural for us. It's the type of error we should be expected to make, and so we should be on guard for it. Um, the, as far as I can tell, uh, not, uh, you know, and I'll be happy to get like real documentation on some contrary opinions on this, but uh, as far as I can tell, this assumption is undocumented. It violates a basic risk management principle. Um, and our theoretical problems uh, are long lasting. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical and red flags come up for me when I see uh, uh, definitions that appear to be tautologies or have other problems. So uh, based on that, uh, I think that uh, faster than light physics as a widely understood, very efficiently communicated vision of success is uh, probably a good goal to succeed, even if nature does not ultimately allow it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Buck Field, uh, Mike Bowler, Patrick Festa for joining us on episode six of the Wow Signal. I'm sorry, of the Unseen Podcast. <laughs> uh, go to unseenpodcast.com for more. So I can have uh, and again, uh, if you want to find out any how you can be on the panel, also email me at unseenpodcast at gmail dot com. We'll be back uh, with another episode of the Unseen Podcast, so stay tuned, and you can subscribe with iTunes or Stitcher or any of your whatever your favorite uh, podcast catcher is and we'll see you then it's the 8th of may 2015 this has been episode six of 
the Unseen Podcast. I'm Paul Carr. Good night. <laughs>